graduated what was called ceramic engineering at this time, and then went on to Stanford, where in three years he received not only his master's but his PhD. And at that time, one of the premier companies, the equivalent maybe a Apple today in Silicon Valley, Hewlett Park Packard, hired him. And so for the next uh, about 15 years, he worked for Hewlett Packard, and during that time, invented a process which has had a huge impact as we're here today. So this is organometallic vapor phase epitaxy, learning how to put three five compounds down so there's very low lattice mismatch. And uh, it has really revolutionized the devices that we use. As he came back to the University of Utah after doing a sabbatical in Stuttgart, Germany, Germany he started a research group and had a very active research group here at the University of Utah. He and Senna conducted work and won the Distinguished Research Award for the university. Later, he was given the highest award at the university, the Rosenbach Prize, and is a member of the National Academy of Engineers. He's won a lot of other prizes, which we won't talk about today. But he served as an army chair twice, which if you can imagine that Mike having to do it a second time, you <laughs> realize that, that is a, a gift. He also served as dean of the college from 2000, or 1998 to 2003. And what, this is the first of 10 different lectures we'll have this semester. And the purpose of these is to show that you can make a difference in the world. That what you do in life can make a, a difference. And there couldn't be anyone better to start this off than Professor Springfellow. So we we'll turn the time over to him. And thank you so much, Jerry, for coming. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, Professor Cutler has encouraged me to talk a little bit about my personal history as I'm describing uh, the technical things that I've done over the years. Uh, so let's see, let's, let's um, advance. So this is what I'll talk about. Um, uh, this is the technical part. I'll talk about uh, three, five alloys, as Raymond said, uh, for light emitting diodes, but they're also used for solar cells and fiber optics and other applications. I'll talk about the historical development, which is something that I don't usually do in a talk like this. And I'll talk about the materials, the growth technique. I'll especially talk about thermodynamics and something that, something that I invented many years ago, the DLP model for uh, being able to model the thermodynamics of these materials. I'll talk about the microstructure and the effect on efficiency. I'll spend a lot of time talking about the gallium indium nitride system that's the key to making white LEDs. Uh, and then if we have time, I'll talk about the future uh, a bit, the use of nanostructures and uh, things like that. So. Uh, before I get here, let me talk about my own uh, personal history. I, I was born in Utah, uh, grew up in Salt Lake. Uh, when I was little, I was very interested in how things worked and making little things to uh, work, making devices. So you could say I was a natural engineer. When I was probably in the second grade, I made this little thing. You've probably made them before with a spool and a rubber band and a uh, matchstick that will crawl along the floor with uh, elastic band uh, uh, pushing it along. And then by the time I got to the sixth grade, I made an electric motor. And so it battery powered, of course. Uh, I also became interested in chemistry. I, I got a chemistry set when I was in the fifth grade. And it made me very interested in chemistry. I used to go to the public library and read uh, books about chemistry. And I eventually had a little laboratory off of my dad's garage where I did dangerous things for a 12-year-old. <laughs> uh, I had uh, sulfuric acid and nitric acid and hydrochloric acid. And I made hydrogen. And a foolish junior high school science teacher 
gave me some mercuric oxide. And so since I had hydrogen, I could reduce it to mercury metal and then oxidize it back again to mercury oxide. It's amazing that I'm still here uh, <laughs> screwing around with mercury. But I also, another thing that I did was I, I bought a uh, crystal set, and I can't remember the exact circumstances. Do you even know what a crystal set is? Anybody in here know what a crystal set is? It's a, what it is is it's a, a lead sulfide uh, crystal, and you attach a wire to it, and it makes a rectifier, and with a capacitor and a, and a coil and a battery, of course, you can intercept AM radio waves, and, and I could hear the radio through these headphones. It's an amazing thing for a kid to think about being surrounded by <laughs> the, all these waves, you know, that, we, that uh, can carry information uh, to us. And so that made me really, really interested in making my own radio. I wanted to make a real radio with vacuum tubes. And so I had a paper route, and I would go around uh, collecting for my paper route, and people would throw out a radio, and I would take it home. And so I would use the tubes. In those days, of course, radios had tubes. Capacitors, resistors, uh, coils, tra and transformers especially, and uh, try to make my own radio. I'd go to the library and find books about how, how these radios work. Um, but again, this is a very dangerous thing for a kid because the, you probably don't know this, but the voltage on the plate of a vacuum tube is 400, 500, 600 volts. And so here I am, this young teenager, screwing around with chemicals one day and uh, 400 volts the next day, 500, 600 volts. I, by the way, didn't have any hair on my hands or my face from, uh, from hydrogen, making hydrogen that exploded and burned and so forth. Uh, so I, I was, I'd like to say I was born to be an engineer. Uh, I was interested from the very beginning. Um, and, um, but this radio thing, uh, something very important happened in the late 50s. And that is at Bell Labs, they developed the transistor. Shockley and Bardeen developed the transistor. They got the Nobel Prize for it eventually. But for me, it meant that I could go to the hobby store and buy germanium. They were germanium transistors in those days. They cost five, about $5 each. $5 in those days is $50 today from a paper route, my, my, my paper route money. But I made a radio that worked with three germanium transistors and all the parts that I'd gathered from uh, old radios. And that was a highlight of my young life, I have to say. And we'll come back to this a little bit later, germanium. Um, and then I took normal classes, nurse science and math classes in high school. And when I got to the U, I came to the U and knew I wanted to be an engineer. But I thought that I wanted to be an electrical engineer for radios, you know, I'm interested in radios. And so I, was, I thought, thought that's what I would want to do. But then uh, the, in those days, each of the department chairs would give a lecture to the incoming uh, freshman engineering students and explain what went on in their uh, fields. And that's when I met a guy named Ivan Cutler, the father of Raymond Cutler. He was the head of what was then called ceramic engineering. It's material science, really, but it was called ceramic engineering. I guess to separate it from mechanical or uh, metallurgical engineering, that Milt, Milt Wadsworth was here at that time, and he was the king of metallurgical engineering. So Ivan had to be a little different. So I guess that's where the ceramic engineering came from. I did learn to make pots and things like that. But the other thing I learned was about semiconductor materials. And uh, he was a terrific mentor. He was very charismatic. And um, I learned a lot about semiconductor materials in that course, as well as uh, toilets and pots. Um, so he was a very important guy in my life. He steered me to material science. And then uh, when I, so I was here for four years. And when it came time to graduate, 
I had promised my wife that we wouldn't leave Utah, that I would let her stay in, in Utah with me. But Ivan said, no, you've got to get out of here. We're not going to have you as a PhD student. You need to go to Stanford or MIT or Northwestern. So I applied to all these places and ended up going to Stanford because it was in Silicon Valley. This, is the, this was the heart of the semiconductor industry. Um, the good thing about what happened at this time is NSF was really, people were really afraid of Sputnik. And so NSF had these uh, fellowships. Uh, I think they still have them, uh, graduate fellowships. And I got a graduate fellowship to go to Stanford, so I never paid tuition. They actually gave me a little bit of money to live on. Um, and uh, so I had this successful career at Stanford. And I worked for a guy named Dick Bube, who was working on LEDs, the material zinc selenide for LEDs, for blue. Blue LEDs, which was really a stretch uh, in those days. Um, and we wrote a few papers, some of which still get referenced, uh, even to this day, a few of them. Um, and then um, I got to know people from Hewlett Packard. They were working on LEDs, too. And so that's where I start the slides. Uh, here, this, is, this is the tool that I used for doing logarithms and sines and cosines. Have you even seen this before? <laughs> Raise your hand if you know what this is. <laughs> you, a lot of you don't. It's a slide rule, and you manipulate it, and you learn about logarithms and things like that, exponentiation using these things. But Bill Hewlett, oh, let's see, I've got to use this to advance it. Bill Hewlett had the idea, the Hewlett of Hewlett and Packard, of uh, replacing the slide rule, because we had integrated circuits these day, in those days, uh, not integrated circuits, but discrete components, actually, that would do multiplication and division and logarithmics and all that stuff. And so this was the first handheld calculator. And it, had, uh, it, it you see the LEDs here. There was no display that could be battery powered at that time. And so he wanted to work on light-emitting diodes. And these are gallium arsenide phosphide light-emitting diodes that emit red light. They're very, very inefficient, about 1% or 2%. And so inside of this whole thing was a big battery <laughs> to run the display. That's, that's where all the, all the uh, juice was, was, went to, is to this, uh, this LED uh, display. So that's how, I, and, and I got started working on these gallium arsenide phosphide LEDs. And my job over the years, my job was to make these things more efficient. So I'll talk about that a bit. And to devise new materials, to explore new materials and growth techniques to make better, much better LEDs. And that has been successful. Right now, red LEDs are about 50% efficient. And I'll talk about green uh, LEDs, green and blue LEDs. Blues are up to more than 90% efficient, if you can believe that. So I'll talk about that whole journey. Um, so th uh, another thing that Hewlett Packard used these things for was uh, they, are, they, are, they make electronic uh, uh, component, or uh, like voltmeters and amp meters and that kind of stuff in those days. So they needed indicator lamps. So these are what the indicator lamps look like. This is the inside of an indicator lamp. You have this tiny LED. I should say that. The LEDs are the size of a grain of sand. They're tiny, tiny things. And then they go into a reflective uh, lead frame. And then they're, they're covered with epoxy. And of course, you have to get voltage to them. And then the light comes out. And, it's, and it's, uh, this is a lens, basically. So it, it makes quite, well, it likes, in those days, it made OK indicator lamps because these were the uh, instruments that you plugged into the wall. So the efficiency didn't matter quite so much. So they, uh, the other things that these LEDs are used for today are traffic signals. And anytime you see these traffic signals these days, they are LEDs. 
This is a television set. My television, at least, is uh, LED. They have liquid crystal television sets, too. But the, this is an LED television set. And this is the Jumbotron. You know about these. Every stadium has a Jumbotron. Those are LED uh, displays. So they, and, and headlights for cars, are either LEDs, or I should mention they could be lasers. Lasers are LEDs that have an optical cavity. They're in an optical cavity, so you get stimulated emission. And then, of course, the big uh, device is the light bulb. And uh, we didn't even think that, we never thought in the early days that we could, that this was a, a lighting, that we were talking about lighting sometime in the future. Um, but that's what's played a big role, is being able to make white lights. Um, and this is, th these are some of the reasons that, um, that LEDs are, have become so important. They use a tenth of the power of an inc incandescent uh, lamp. Um, of course, there's a gigantic uh, savings in terms of both pollution, you have less pollution, and in uh, saving money on lighting. Um, and this, this shows a comparison of the different kinds of light sources. So here's my standard incandescent that I started with that we now make. Well, this was a pretty good in, incandescent down here. It looks like it's about 10%. Um, and uh, mercury vapor, fluorescent, these are all the kinds of lighting. Low pressure sodium is the most e efficient. But here's what LEDs have done. They really started taking off about the time that I was at HP, started at HP, and now they are by far the most efficient. 250 is about, I should t talk about what this is. These are lumens per watt. This tells you how much light you see per watt that goes into the uh, device. So it, it has the eye response, the human eye response, as a part of it. Um, so these, this is a summary for the, that explains the strong growth of LEDs. They use a tenth of the power. It's a gigantic market at $75 billion last year. It's expected to, it's still growing fast. Um, so people are predicting 50% reduction in electricity for lighting um, and saving 380 power stations because they're so efficient and we use so much electricity for lighting. They're convenient, they're small, you can dim them. There are many colors these days. They're green technology, no mercury, and they last 50,000 hours. So I don't, when I put light bulbs in my house, I don't expect them to ever fail, but they do. They were made in China, <laughs> and the electrical parts, not the LEDs, but the electrical components, reducing the 110 volts uh, AC to three or four volts DC, which an LED runs on, uh, that fail. Those are the things that fail. Okay, now let's get back to the materials. Um, I've already talked about germanium. This was the material that the first transistors were made out of, and that has evolved to silicon, which is, well, it's the, it's the standard of integrated circuits, of course. But these materials are not good for LEDs, and it's because the electrons in the holes are separated in K space, which means a recombination event has to involve, make a photon to conserve energy, but also a phonon con to conserve momentum. The electron and hole have different momentum uh, states. And so they are very, very inefficient, and they can't be used for light emitting diodes. So that leaves us with the three five compounds. This is group three of the periodic table in group five. Germanium and, and silicon are group four elements. And the first one that people investigated was gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide makes a good LED, but it's in the infrared, so you can't see it. You, you, you probably have a gallium arsenide LED in your remote control for your TV, 
At least some, some remote controls use uh, photons to switch. Um, but it's in the infrared, and so the material, the first material that I worked on, and the one that was used at HP, was adding phosphorus. Yet, as you go up in the periodic table, the, the strength of the bonds increases, and the band gap increases, and the band gap determines the color of the light that's coming out of these things. So you can make a visible uh, light emitting diode with gallium arsenide phosphide. There are all these other interesting materials too, and I'll talk about them a little bit later. So this uh, is a little diagram uh, showing the band gap energy versus the lattice constant. And I'll tell you why that's important. If you look at gallium arsenide phosphide, gallium, gallium arsenide phosphide, um, it's grown on, and, and I'll talk about epitaxial growth in a minute, but it's grown on a substrate that's gallium arsenide, and so there's that problem. You, you have a, a mismatch in the lattice constant. And then another thing happens, when you get up here, this means it's indirect, the dashed lines. It's direct when you have a solid line, and it's indirect when you have the uh, dashed line. And so when you're trying to change the, the, so red is right in here somewhere. If you want to make, see, gallium arsenide phosphide. If you want to make yellow, it's indirect. And so it doesn't work very well. We'll come back to that again in a, uh, in a minute. So this shows uh, the, the two materials that are used for LEDs these days. This was our, starting here, gallium arsenide phosphide. So my idea, they gave me three months off from norm, my normal duties to, to, to try to figure out what the next material would be. And so I thought the next material should be gallium indium phosphide. That's this line here, gallium indium phosphide. And a red vitamin diode, actually aluminum gallium indium phosphide was the system I was interested in. You could add aluminum to this and you can make a red LED that has the same lattice constant as the gallium arsenide substrate. And again, I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Uh, but that was the idea. At this time, we were growing materials. There were two major growth techniques. For, these are now epitaxial layers that we're growing. They have to be, they're very perfect, they're very pure, and you need that for a light emitting diode. Otherwise, they have not what's called non-radiative recombination. So I want to talk about that. And then later on, I'll talk about how you get to the blue. That's the aluminum, gallium, indium nitride system. They, they both have aluminum, gallium, and indium, but this is nitride and this is phosphide. So this shows uh, the progress of light emitting diodes over the years. So I started clear back here with gallium arsenide phosphide with a very low uh, efficiency. Uh, here's Thomas Edison's light bulb, so you can see how bad it was. Uh, I worked on gallium phosphide with, ox uh, with zinc and oxygen, and uh, also with nitrogen. I'll talk about that a little. Oh, that's, that's here. There it is. And anyway, as we went to aluminum gallium indium phosphide, the efficiency went up and up and up. And then, much later, came the blue, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But these are by far, so that we've got fluorescent lights here. You can see we've, we've done much better than fluorescent lighting these days. Um, so this, this is um, a light emitting diode. So a light emitting diode is a PN junction. You uh, put a voltage on it, so it forces electrons in this direction, holes in this direction when you have both together they can recombine emitting a photon with an energy, h nu is equal to the band gap. I'll come back to this a little bit later. This is a gallium uh, nitride, a blue LED. But the, the thing is, it's grown on a sapphire substrate. We don't have gallium nitride substrates. And that causes a lot of problems. That causes a lot of defects in the material. And I'll talk about that as we go along. So now I come to epitaxy. So epitaxy is a process where you have a substrate, single crystalline substrate, and uh, you rain atoms down 
from either the vapor or the liquid phase, and they grow an epitaxial layer. And it can be either homoepitaxy. So if this were gallimarsenide and gallimarsenide, that's homoepitaxy. But if we're talking gallimarsenide phosphide, this is gallimarsenide substrate, gallimarsenide phosphide. And that causes problems at this interface because they have different lattice constants. That's why I've been talking about the uh, lattice constant. Um, and so it produces dislocations, as I said. And these are, this is a compilation from Lester. But a lot of these uh, numbers come from my work. We looked at gallium arsenide phosphide, looked at the efficiency versus the dislocation density, also gallium phosphide. They all show the same tendency. If you have dislocations, and we did have about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 dislocations. So that's one of the reasons that the gallium arsenide phosphide efficiency is 1 or 2 percent because of all these dislocations that cause the electrons and holes to recombine without emitting light. So we'll come back to this, too, again a little bit later. So um, for reasons that I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, I decided that the way to make aluminum, gallium, indium phosphide for LEDs was a, t a brand new technique called organometallic vapor phase epitaxy. And that's been a big part of my career. I wrote a, a book about uh, OMVPE that was actually came out in its second edition, but it was a long time ago, 1999. Uh, the idea is you have a cold tube, you heat the substrate sitting on a graphite susceptor, and then you pass trimethyl gallium. It's a hydrogen ambient, basically, with arsine and trimethyl gallium. They decompose on the surface and make, in this case, a gallium arsenide epitaxial layer. I didn't invent this technique, by the way. It was invented by a guy named um, Manasevit, who worked at Rockwell. Uh, but the, when I started doing it, there were five people in the world who were interested in this technique. We all got together once in a while. <laughs> uh, and this is what a modern OMVP reactor looks like, because all LEDs and solar cells are made using OMVPE. So this is what a reactor looks like. They cost a million dollars or more, uh, a big commercial uh, reactor. Now I want to start talking thermodynamics. Uh, this is, I, w I was very interested, I think I said, I loved thermodynamics when I was a student. I took a lot of thermodynamics classes. And uh, so I, we were doing li liquid phase epitaxy at that time, and I wanted a way of predicting what the solid composition would be versus the liquid composition. And so I developed a model that I'll talk about in a minute. Hydride VPE is almost the same. The interesting thing is, here's organometallic VPE and MBE. That's another technique, modern technique. They have an enormous difference in chemical potential, a driving force between the, the vapor and the solid. So normally, what would you say? You would say, thermodynamics is not going to tell you the answer to this. It's going to be all kinetics when you've got, you don't have equilibrium. You don't see any equilibrium here. And so that was the one of the first ideas that I had was this is what it would look like in, uh, in OMVPE with an indium phosphide substrate. Now we're going indium phosphide just because that was a slide that I had handy. And what happens is the reactants get depleted, especially the group three, because you have a lot more of the group five than the group three. So the group three, they come out together, and in one indium for every phosphorus, so you deplete the trimethyl uh, indium, or the indium. And that means, and this, this shows the chemical potential. This is what OMVP looks like. The chemical potential is all dropped across the boundary layer, so it's all used to diffuse. And you have near equilibrium between the vapor at the interface and the solid. And so that opens the door to using thermodynamics to predict the solid composition from OMVPE. So you, if the idea of equilibrium at the solid interface, 
solid vapor interfaces. You have the, uh, the uh, partial pressures. The, this is the mass action expression. Uh, when you have the gallium, much less than the arsenic, have equilibrium at the solid vapor interface. And the group three is nearly depleted at the interface. And so that means the distribution coefficient for the group threes is unity. If you remember the distribution coefficient is the ratio of the concentration in the vapor versus the concentration in the solid. So it's the same. You get the same ratio in the solid as you did in the vapor, and that is incredibly important, an important insight. What it means is for aluminum, gallium, and phosphide, the aluminum, phosph the uh, gallium, and um, yes, aluminum, gallium, and phosphide, the aluminum is, the aluminum arsenide or phosphide is so stable that all the aluminum gets sucked out of the vapor. And so it's impossible to control the aluminum concentration by controlling the concentration in the uh, vapor. Uh, so it just doesn't, doesn't work. But here's organometallic VPE. The distribution coefficient is unity. So it's ideal for controlling aluminum gallium indium phosphide or aluminum gallium indium nitride LEDs. So that's a big, that was a big step forward. So just to remind you, these are the two materials that we're talking about. Former techniques can't be used and you have to do OMVPE. And this is a, a major event. This was, happened in about 1976. I wrote a paper about this. HP wasn't fond of my writing fundamental thermodynamic papers, but somehow this got through. Um, so uh, the other thing I want to talk about now is a model for the uh, enthalpy of the solid. And I developed this thing called the DLP model. Um, it was based on the Phillips Van Vechten model, which is a closed form uh, description of the enthalpy of mixing. You all know what enthalpy is, right? It's just energy, basically. Um, the enthalpy of all kinds of semiconductors, the enthalpy of the solid. And I decided to, to apply this to uh, alloys. And so I could uh, calculate the, the enthalpy of formation versus composition in alloys in the DLP model. And, uh, and I, I did this because I wanted to explain the solid composition when you have mixing on the group five element. So the group three was simple. The group five, you need some knowledge of thermodynamics of the solid. And so I, uh, the, end, the end result was you have a delta H of mixing, which has this symmetrical form. This omega is the interaction parameter and x and one minus x. The enthalpy of mixing is always positive. I should say one other thing. Notice this delta A squared. What would you think if you saw that the uh, enthalpy of mixing was proportional to delta A squared? Sort of looks like strain, right? Strain energy. And that's basically what this amounts to. It's a strain energy model. But the inter the, you get this form and it does have one adjustable parameter, but it's the same for all the three, five semiconductors. And so I'll show you how, how well it works. But one thing that uh, comes out of this when you get a, a delta H of mixing that's positive is you can get in immiscibility, like, like oil and water. And you can, so you can't grow many of these uh, alloys by equilibrium techniques. And it also gives rise to compositional clustering. When you grow using OMVPE and MBE, you get compositional fluctuations. And I'm going to talk a lot about this. It's just a little introduction. So uh, I, I used DLP to calculate the solid composition. And uh, using this idea of equilibrium at the solid va vapor interface and using the DLP model um, and assuming complete pyrolysis and so forth and so forth. And um, I'll show you how it works. But I wanted to, this part in red is just a little aside, a really interesting phenomenon that was fun at the time. And that is 
we would grow gallium indium phosphide by LPE. And then I fixed it up so we could have a laser shining into the, uh, the under the objective lens and, and excite the uh, crystals that we'd grown. And when we, so this is gallium indium phosphide. When they're, they, when it's grown as an epitaxial layer on the gallium arsenide substrate, you get one color of light. These, this is actually a, this is a, a uh, schematic. And then the unconstrained crystals, they don't have the same, you don't have to worry about what the lattice constant is for these things that are unconstrained. Those were green crystals, a really fun, interesting phenomenon. And it's called lattice latching. And it's all due to strain energy. You have to include the strain energy in the total energy of the uh, system. Um, and we could explain that thermodynamically. So now I'm going back to the DLP model with mixing on the group five sublattice. This was some old data for um, gallium arsenide and timonide. Gallium arsenide and timonide. Um, and this was their data. And this was my model. This is what my model showed. So that made it very exciting to think about this DLP model. And so we pushed it to a much more difficult system, putting nitrogen into gallium phosphide. We were looking at this for green LEDs. And this is the nitrogen concentration as a function of temperature, putting nitrogen into gallium phosphide. You can only put in a tiny amount these numbers are the, the uh, numbers per cubic centimeter. They're very tiny amounts. These are experimental data. And this was the calculation with no, the uh, parameter was not adjusted to make this work. And so this showed that for a wide range of lattice constants, a wide range of uh, materials, we could calculate what the solid composition would be based on what the vapor was. And this opened a whole door for me. I, for the rest of my career, I was looking at different alloys covering almost the whole periodic table of group 3.5. Three, three, These are all 3.5 semiconductors. So here's what the periodic table looks like. Again, so gallium arsenide, we're talking now about gallium indium phosphide, gallium indium phosphide. Um, but these days, we're interested in much more, well, well, I'll talk about gallium nitride, gallium indium nitride a lot later. But one of the things that's really happening out at the uh, NREL, they're adding bismuth to gallium arsenide. And it's, it's, before you ever start doing the experiment, wouldn't it be nice to know how much bismuth you're going to have to put in the vapor phase before you get uh, bismuth in a solid? And will it go in? Is there a giant miscibility gap? There is in this case, because the lattice constant is so different. Um, so let's see, what else do I want to say? Uh, you can still grow these things by non-equilibrium uh, conditions. I should add that. Uh, so now getting, going back to this uh, slide that we were talking about, here's our aluminum gallium indium Phosphide, we found out we could grow it um, by ONVPE. We could understand the solid composition. Um, and I think the next slide starts me on, yes, it does, on the green L, or the blue LED. So you've seen this slide already, but this is what a gallium phosphide LED looks like. It's very complex. It has what's called quantum wells in here. These are thicknesses of a few nanometers. Uh, but they, they push electrons and holes together, and so increase the efficiency. But here's the problem. You're growing on a sapphire substrate. And that means these materials have 10 to the 9 dislocations. So you saw what happened at 10 to the 6 dislocations. So here's what, this is, this is the uh, luminous efficacy. You can see the eye response here. These are the uh, gallium and, aluminum gallium indium phosphide. Here you're losing luminosity because, just because of the eye response. Here you're losing it because they, 
because it's becoming more indirect. Remember, they, when it's indirect, the, the electron and hole have different values of uh, momentum. Uh, and then here's the, here are the blue. There, aluminum, gallium, indium, nitride. This, again, is the I response. Here, this is falling off because the quality of the material goes uh, down. So this is called the green gap. The, the very peak of our I response is where the efficiency is the lowest, unfortunately, for light of any diodes. Um, now, uh, going back to the materials that we've been talking about, uh, we've, that, this is the reason, by the way, that we have band gap versus lattice constant. So you can see uh, you, need lattice mis you need lattice matched systems, and the gallium indium phosphide is a good one. For the, uh, for the red, this would be the red, but then we pushed it up here to the yellow and into the green, too. So we made yellow and green light emitting diodes in that material as well. So I think I've already showed this slide. So we have to, we have to use OMVPE to make these materials. And this is how the uh, field has has progressed. This was gallium arsenide phosphide. Uh, here's aluminum gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium indium phosphide up here. You get much more, uh, much higher uh, luminosity. And then this is when green started, or blue started. I worked on zinc selenide, by the way, as a graduate student, if you remember. Uh, so um, blue has really come on. In a hurry, and that's why the three guys got the Nobel Prize. You know, the three Japanese researchers, uh, Nakamura, Akasaki, and Amano, got the Nobel Prize. Then I need to mention one other thing, and that's white. Obviously, white is an important part of this whole thing. And I think, well, somewhere I've got a slide that shows to make white, you need a red and a blue and a green LED, or you need a blue LED, and then you need to cover it with something, a phosphor, that converts, down converts some of the photons, so it makes white. That's how white LEDs are made. I'll talk about that again in a minute, too. But the inter another interesting thing, this is like semiconductors in general. The cost has gone down, so that it's relatively cost-effective to uh, change to LED uh, white lights. So now um, you've seen this slide before. I'm going to talk about compositional clustering in metastable alloys. So uh, let me remind you of uh, the basic thermodynamics. When you, when you look at the, enthalp the uh, entropy of mixing, that's this curve as you make an alloy. That is always, that always goes in a positive direction. How come? Entropy loves randomness. So it's more, you, it, it becomes more room for randomness up here. So entropy will always make you want to make homogeneous alloys. But when you add enthalpy, as I said already, you always get a negative uh, uh, contribution to the free energy. What we're interested in is the free energy of mixing, of course, the sum of the enthalpy minus T times the entropy. What happens when this is, when delta H is positive, it always uh, gives rise to a, a miscibility gap. So this shows the phase diagram. At a certain temperature, you want to, sep if you're trying to go this alloy, it will separate into these two phases at equilibrium. I don't have time to talk about spinodal decomposition, but these are the spinodes. They are, they are um, calculable by this technique, too. The, uh, the, other, the, interesting, the other interesting point here is the critical temperature. Critical temperature is this interaction parameter that I talked about, uh, divided by two times the gas constant. And so we'll be talking about the critical temperature of different materials as we go along. This shows how important this is for all, basically all the different 3,5 alloy systems. These are isotherms. They show 
All the, all the regions inside of the isotherms have spinal decomposition. Outside, you can get uniform layers. So when aluminum and gallium, when they're mixed, they have the same size. Aluminum and gallium have the same covalent radii. And so they don't have miscibility gaps, really. But um, most of these systems show immiscibility. So this is a very important part of de devising alloys for use in various uh, applications. Well, this is just the delta lattice parameter again, uh, how it was, uh, what it looks like in its entirety. And um, the, the most important thing is, though, that it's the delta A squared that comes into this. Uh, it's a little more complicated model than that. Uh, now, this is uh, more recent data from Madison. Tom Keech's group uh, looked, had a serious look at the DLP model, and they uh, looked at this particular alloy, indium gallium arsenide, with bismuth added. And bismuth is very large, so it doesn't fit into the solid. So you get a delta H of mixing that looks like this. But the important point, the important part of this diagram are these three little dots. These days, you can use, do first principles calculations using large computer calculations. And look how well the DLP model fits the DFT results. That's, that right there is an amazing result. That is this simple model, back of the envelope kind of a model, can predict things as well as these very large scale uh, first principles calculations. So now let's go back to uh, other applications for these materials. This is for, this is again from NREL, uh, for triple junction solar cells, you're interested in the same materials, and they, ended up, they end up being gallium indium phosphide. Most of them end up being gallium indium phosphide, but they've also explored uh, gallium arsenide nitride, that shows the band gap versus composition, and other materials. So people are still interested in uh, using uh, the things that I've just described for solar cell applications as well as LEDs. They're also used in high speed uh, transistors and other, and other things. So uh, this is just a repeat basically of what I've told you except that um, you can fool Mother Nature a little bit by reducing kinetics. So the, for instance, in gallium in, or aluminum gallium and phosphide, you can stop the uh, formation of clustering by slowing down the diffusion process. And so that's how it's done, is to make metastable alloys. But of course, you get more defects as you go to lower temperatures. So now I want to go back and talk about uh, some specific materials. Um, this in red is adding nitrogen to gallium phosphide. I've already talked about this. It has a critical temperature of 8,000 degrees. So basically, you can't grow these things by equilibrium techniques. And I've showed you this already. It predicts very well the solid composition and the miscibility gap. Um, two other pop popular materials these days are putting nitrogen into gallium arsenide, 10,000 degree. <laughs> Uh, critical temperature, or adding bismuth to gallium arsenide, pretty high critical temperature. And um, what you get when you're doing gallium arsenide bismuth, you can see that you get phase separation here. This, cluster, th this is a TEM uh, picture, and the contrast here is the gallium arsenide bismuth, and you can see phase separation occurring uh, so again, not surprisingly, the, the DLP model correctly predicts that you would get that. Now here's the really interesting one that I'm going to spend a bit of time on, and that's gallium indium nitride. It has a critical temperature of 1222. That's the best number that we know of from calculations. And as a result, this is work from Fran Fernando Ponce down in Arizona, showing the binodal and that's what I'm going to uh, 
concentrate on. So this would be uniform out here, and this would, all of this would have um, phase separation. Oh, let's see, wait a second. Not everything, oh, there it is. And so it shows the experimental results that Fernando is a uh, electron micros microscopist. He found uniform materials out here. This is the growth temperature, and then phase separation inside of here. So again, it agrees well with the calculations of the DLP model. And then this is the entire phase diagram showing uniform out here and phase separation as you go into here. This is a problem. If you want to make um, LEDs, you need to go into the emissibility. If you want to make blue LEDs uh, or green LEDs, you have to go into the emissibility gap. And this is where the interesting part of the, of the uh, problem starts. So we have all kinds of empirical evidence for phase separation in these materials, X-ray, atomic probe, tomography, TEM, um, and other, other things. But the extent isn't just dependent on thermodynamics, it also is dependent on kinetics. But let me just show you a, a few of these data. So this is TEM data showing phase separation. You can tell. So these are the gallium nitride interlayers, and these, these are the quantum wells. And these are quantum dots, basically, that are formed by phase separation. That's the thing. It's happening naturally. Nobody did anything to make this happen. It, ha it, it naturally, you can see the scale. These are quantum dots, basically. And this is um, tomography, atomic probe tomography. And again, you get these compositional fluctuations. The more indium you put in, that's this one, the bigger these compositional fluctuations are. You notice they're sizable fluctuations, 10% in indium composition. And this is sort of the bottom line. This is what happens to the, to the efficiency of LEDs made in gallium-indium phosphide as a function of indium concentration, is you add indium, even though you get phase separation and clustering, the efficiency goes up. So this part I'm going to talk about more. Also, though, if you add too much, you get defects in the uh, gallium-indium nitride. So that causes the efficiency to go down. So now this is the puzzle. I showed you this slide before. The dislocation density when you grow in a sapphire substrate, gallium nitride, is out here at 10 to the 9. So how in the devil can you get efficient blue LEDs with this kind of a dislocation density? That was a big problem. There's been thousands of papers written about this. And, well, this just again reminds you that the sapphire, the lattice mismatch between the sapphire and the gallium nitride is what causes these uh, dislocations. So my theory, and I think it's pretty well accepted these days, is that compositional modulations are the key. You have a dislocation that produces non-radiative recombination, but the carriers can't get there. They're excited here, and these, these are, they're trapped by the high indium concentration areas. You have little traps and it stops the carriers from moving around so they can't get to the dislocation. And so, as you add indium, the more indium you add, the bigger the compositional fluctuations and the more efficient the, device, the devices are. These, the best devices these days, uh, the best blue LEDs, this is a blue LED would be in this region, is uh, more than 90%. I think I mentioned that already. This just goes, this is just a kind of repeat of what I showed earlier about the, how we've evolved the red LEDs into aluminum, gallium, indium phosphide, and then the blue LEDs, aluminum, gallium, indium nitride, compared with other different kind of light sources. This is, this data is a little bit old, shows the efficiency, how the efficiency has changed from the 1990 to the present. And I should just say that the blue is now up here more than 90%. The red is stuck at 50%, pretty much. 
Now let's talk about white lights. I alluded to this earlier. Uh, to make a white light, you need blue to get a white light. Obviously, if you're combining the primary colors, you need blue. But another way of doing it is if you have a blue LED, you cover it with a material that has phosphors in it that changes some of the blue light into yellow light. And so you end up with uh, covering the entire color spectrum and you get a white LED. That's a very, that's a very poor way of making a white LED because you lose power anytime you try to down convert from blue to yellow photons. So here's a, now we're moving into the future, futuristic view, uh, is to actually use these little quantum dots to control the quantum dots so that you get two uh, peak wavelengths. You get one from the gallium nitride or indium gallium nitride with, with uh, low indium and one from the high gallium indium nitride. You get those and you can add them together and it will make white light without having to have a phosphor. So let's see, how am I doing for time? I still have another five minutes, right? Okay, so here's, so let me give you a summary and then talk a little bit about the future. So we've talked about how important LEDs are, talked about thermodynamics, we've talked about growth methods, talked about the DLP model and how it's a strain energy model, but it allows you to get the solid composition to predict the solid composition in unknown alloys. And it allows you to predict the, the microstructure at equilibrium, namely compositional fluctuations. And um, it's the key to understanding why blue LEDs work. Now, uh, there's some new uh, materials that people are working on. I've talked about it a little bit. Adding nitrogen to gallium arsenide, adding bismuth to gallium arsenide, and the thermodynamics gives you a foundation for understanding uh, the growth of these materials. I've talked about phase separation, giving white LEDs. Now I want to talk about nanowires. That's the latest thing. Everybody is working on nanostructures and nanowires. So um, when you have uh, nanostructures, these wires are growing up. There's no constraint on the, on the uh, lateral uh, size, and so they grow without dislocations. And that's a, an important part, an important point. Um, so you can actually enhance recombination by uh, doing this, and I'll show you some examples. Uh, they're stain-free, strain no mismatch dislocations, and that, by the way, enhances phase separation. Strain tends to slow down to decrease the amount of phase separation. Uh, so in the gallium and the nitride system, I'll show you some results that show that when you use quantum wires, you can um, cover the entire range. So th this is what the quantum wires look like. Uh, here's, here's an array of quantum wires made into a, uh, an LED. Um, and it gives us peak wavelength. And you can also make heterostructures in quantum wells this way too. This is a very interesting story. I guess I have a minute to talk about that. Uh, Charles Lieber is a professor at uh, Harvard, and he got into trouble. You, I don't know if you remember his name. He got into trouble because he was associating closely with Chinese labs and not reporting it to the IRS. So he got put in jail. Charles Lieber did. One of the, mo one of the premier scientists in this area, sadly. So this is some work from Berkeley. Um, showing what happens when you make quantum, uh, these quantum well, or quantum wire LEDs, you can cover the entire color spectrum. This shows the, the uh, photoluminescence, shows the energy, or the, yeah, the energy versus composition. So this is very exciting and very promising that you can um, use, perhaps use quantum wires to make efficient LEDs across the whole spectrum in gallium nitride. That would be handy if you could have gallium, nit gallium indium nitride making all the primary colors for a white LED. That would be the best solution for a white LED. 
And then they're adding to that using uh, quantum wells in addition to quantum wires for making this. So this is a very popular uh, field of research right now. And I think that's, that's all I have time for and all I want to say today. So thank you. And I'm glad to answer questions if you have them. <laughs>